How do you start a business from scratch and only a handful of years later, seven years later, in fact, you're about to do $100 million in revenue? Man, that's a pretty impressive meteoric rise in business revenue, isn't it? You go from zero, you get an idea, you start, you lose some money in the first year, maybe you do 50K or 500K in the next couple of years, but then somehow, somewhere along the line, you do a big jump and you go to $100 million. Well, how to do that, because <laughs> let's get the blueprint for it, right? We're actually going to talk to uh, the man who did it in conjunction with a couple of business partners or a business partner, and then we, he's added another one since then. Uh, today's guest is a gentleman by the name of Evan Tardy, and he's based out in Nashville, Tennessee, where I was recently. And Evan uh, is responsible for helping build a company called DrAxe.com. That's Dr. Axe. And there's a very famous chiropractor, he's famous now, called Josh Axe. And he's the face of the company. He's the, the chiropractor uh, and the brand. And he helps people with uh, various health um, advice and health education. And Evan uh, was employee number one. He's come on. Uh, and really brought his business prowess to it um, to the point where he's grown it from, you know, where they were losing money in the first year to now they're on track this year to do a hundred million dollars. And he's responsible for an ad budget that's over a million dollars a month. So he's literally making decisions where he said, well, we're going to spend a million dollars this month promoting the company. And uh, all of this has landed the company, which is drax.com, as number 130 on the Inc. 500 fastest growing companies in America. And the company is the fastest growing company in Tennessee, or at least it was in 2016. And Evan leads a team of 70 plus people. And uh, he's, he's still only in his early 30s. I think he's about 31 or 32. We'll find out for sure. Evan Tardy, welcome to the show, sir. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. So, mate, just give us an overview of what your revenue has been in this business on, you know, the first year and then the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh, just so we've got a little bit of context. Yep. So we grew from, you know, the first year we were um, startup, so we had no revenue, um, trying a lot of stuff, throwing a lot of stuff against the wall, trying to figure out what stuck. Um, so we went from 50,000 to about 150,000 to 500,000, to 2 million, to 11 million. Uh, and then last year at about 47 million on pace this year to do 100 million. Wow, they're astronomical figures. And what is it that you're selling exactly at drx.com? Yeah, so we have two uh, main things that we offer. We have online programs. Uh, we have a handful of different types of programs that we take people through. Uh, and then we have, um, we have about 65 different supplements as well. And these are all natural supplements. So when I, I was actually in Nashville, Tennessee recently, and I was, uh, was staying with one of your, uh, your staff members or one of your, your colleagues, uh, David Tuhill, and I had him on the show on this very podcast and, and his place was just filled with all of your, your, uh, your supplements. So what, what are some of the supplements and, and what's the emphasis that you put on them? Yeah. So our stuff is, uh, organic premium, uh, real food, whole food based products and, you know, we really, uh, the whole message of our brand is that food is medicine. And so everything that we put out, we put out a lot of content, a lot of articles, and, you know, that's the basis of everything that, that kind of goes out from our company is, is that food is medicine. And so even the supplements that we create and put out, we're looking for the highest quality premium and organic uh, formulations that we can create and really deliver the highest quality supplement. So the actual supplements that we have, um, you know, if you go to the doc, go to drx.com and click store, uh, anyone can go check them out, but they are, we have some kind of foundational supplements like your, your multivitamin, um, your omega three, your vitamin D three, B complex, stuff like that. Uh, you know, some whey protein, some pre-workout energizers. Mm. And then about a year ago, we launched a brand called ancient nutrition. And one of the key products around that is a product called bone broth protein. Yeah, I had product. some of that. I had some of that bone broth protein. David gave yeah. me some when I was out there in Nashville. Bone broth is, is excellent for you. Lots of yeah. minerals and nutrients. Exactly. Um, yeah. Okay. And so do you sell only online, Evan, or are you in retail stores also? We're in about 4,000 retail stores right now. Okay. Um, 
So what we're going to talk about on this, this call, um, on this episode, there's going to be some business stuff. Obviously we're going to talk about the business side because if, just to clarify, Evan is not the doctor or the medical experts or the health nutritionist per se. That's, that's left to the face of the company. I guess you'd say Dr. Axe, who's a chiropractor, um, um, with a big health background based out in Nashville. You are really the, the business guy. Is that safe to say, Evan? Yeah, exactly. And, and Dr. Axe is, uh, he, he's an incredible, very, um, you know, how he and I actually met, uh, he went through a business, um, uh, coaching group here in Nashville. And when I was looking to move to Nashville, I started calling around and asking, you know, doing the networking thing, who should I meet? Um, started looking for jobs. And, uh, my brother actually had just met Josh at this, uh, Dave Ramsey's entree leadership. And he said, well, you know, I met, I met, this Josh guy and he has this website that he seems to be kind of getting off the ground. It seems like it's gaining some traction and uh, you two seem like you'd hit it off. And so he put me in touch with Josh and uh, Josh and I talked and uh, we had a, you know, at the time the website, I think it had about 500 visitors like that. Uh, about 500 people that on the Facebook page and, and Josh and I talked and he just shared the vision of, really being able to take this message of nutrition and really helping people transform their lives with a, from a holistic point of view and really get off of the medicine. And, and, you know, like I said, our brand message is, is using food as medicine. And he shared that vision with me and, you know, we were talking and he, and he brought up a couple of books. One was um, the four hour work week and then another book called crush it. And, you know, he said, have you read, have you read these books? You know, on our first conversation, I was like, no, um, I haven't read them. And then we went on to talk about some other stuff and I called him back the next week and I'm like, okay, uh, read both those books. Love it. Um, I don't know how to do that stuff, but we'll figure it out. And <laughs> yeah, I believe in, in your mission and what you're up to so much. I mean, if I have to stack chairs, um, I'll do whatever it takes to be a part of, of what you're doing. And so he was like, <laughs> Okay. Uh, well, call me when you get to town. And so the next month I moved to Nashville and called him up and, uh, we got started. And so I got started out of his kitchen table. Um, and, and that's kind of how we got started. And it only took three weeks until I was actually literally stacking chairs and, uh, and said, you know what, this, I did sign up for this. <laughs> that's how we got started. Wow. Yeah. Did you, did you have any marketing or business prowess when you first sat down with, with, with Dr. X or what was your, your business acumen up until that point that, that let him go, Oh, okay, I'll take this guy seriously. You know, I think Josh believed in me from the beginning. Um, and, and he, Josh is an incredible leader. He's constantly empowered me and given me the vision and goals, but really given me a lot of autonomy and gotten out of my way and just said, Hey, whatever I can do to help you be successful, let me do that. And so um, he's an incredible leader and visionary from that standpoint. And I think one of the things, you know, for me personally, entrepreneurship and, and small business is just kind of in my DNA. My granddad left the family farm when he was uh, out of, out of college. And, you know, the, the path was really clear for him to take over the family farm and continue running it. And he wanted to, you know, take control of his own destiny and left the family farm, moved to the big town of Lubbock, Texas, <laughs> home to about 5,000 people at the time. And, uh, and started out on his own and started his own company. My dad took over that company. Uh, when I was 16, I started my first company and, uh, it, it was a mobile car wash. And so <laughs> entrepreneurship and, and, uh, small business is just kind of in my DNA. And so, I think Josh and I are, are cut from a similar cloth in that um, we both work really hard and, um, you know, believe that we can, we can figure it out and, uh, and there is a way. So I, I, I couldn't tell you exactly, but I think something, um, something having to do with um, just my willingness to, to hustle and try things. Um, so, so you, you had an entrepreneurial background, uh, in your early twenties to the mid twenties when you first met Dr. X. So what was in terms of revenue of any of the businesses that you had created or got involved in, what was the, what was the most successful and what were some of the, the failures maybe? Yeah. Great question. So I didn't have a lot of success. Um, you know, we, uh, I didn't have a lot of success. And when I joined with, with Dr. X, 
um, we were getting started from the ground up. And so, um, you know, there, there, there wasn't a lot of, um, a lot of things that were already in the works, you know, we built a lot of stuff from the ground up. And so in my past, you know, I sold my, my, uh, the company I started when I was 16, the car wash, I think I ended up selling it for maybe $4,000. You know, It was, it was the cost of the rig and, uh, and a handful of, of customers. So, uh, so, you know, my, my business background, I was fresh out of school. Um, I had an av- advertising degree and, you know, just hustled. So I didn't, I didn't have this, any sort of pedigree or, um, any sort of experience that would have, you know, convinced him to, to work with me other than my willingness to just hustle and get after him. Okay. So you, you met Dr. Axe in Nashville. Is that right? Correct. Okay. That's when you first met and you had this conversation, he shared the vision and then you who, who had an advertising degree, but no real business pedigree other than you had a car wash earlier on and you sold for 4k. Like what else was there that you'd been doing in your early twenties to make money? I had a handful of jobs. Um, I did photography uh, to pay the bills, um, some graphic design. I have a lot of stuff. Uh, specifically, um, as I was learning some of these marketing principles and reading books and listening to podcasts, um, I wanted to try some of this stuff out on my own. And as I was meeting people and talking about this stuff, I'm really passionate about marketing and, and helping small business grow. Um, it just kind of naturally comes out. And so um, I met a dentist and he was moving to town. He had just bought a practice. I think they were doing about 80K a month. And, you know, we, we met and I gave him this book. I'm like, you have to read this book, Guerrilla Marketing. It's going to give you some real practical stuff you can implement. And ran into him three or four weeks later and, you know, asked him, hey, how's that book working out for you? And he was like, it hasn't moved from the front seat of my car since you gave it to me. And so I was like, listen, why don't, why don't you let me do some of this marketing stuff for you? Uh, it'll give me a chance to learn and you don't have to worry about anything. I'll just take care of it for you. And so he was like, what do I got to pay you? Uh, you know, that sounds good, but how much is it going to cost? I'm like, nothing. I want to volunteer and just, I just want to do this for you because uh, I knew as soon as I took money for doing this, the the stakes were a lot higher than um, what I wanted them to be. And so volunteering and doing this for him, I literally just bought Perry Marshall's uh, Google AdWords book and went through it page by page, set up his account. And uh, three months later, we got his account, we got, we got his, um, his practice from doing 80K a month to 250K a month. M- majority of that was from the Google AdWords that we had set up. And so... Um, I started slowly kind of getting some wins like that under my belt and, you know, cutting my teeth and getting a little bit of confidence. Mm. I remember when I first made the decision that I was going to be an entrepreneur, like really go for it. And and it's particularly an online entrepreneur. And I I was a sports center anchor on ESPN from 2010 through 2012 Mm. and uh, good job, well paid, got to, be on TV and talk about sport all day. Pretty fun. And then I, I basically set fire to that career and say, I'm going to go and be an online business person. And, and I remember learning things like um, how to write a video sales letter from, a, um, uh, I've forgotten what his name, a guy called John Benson. Mm. And I remember sitting in Bristol, Connecticut, sort of in the, in the weeks before I left ESPN, which is where they're based and, and just going through and sitting in a dark room when it was nice and sunny outside. I'm, in, I'm sitting in this, in this room learning how to write a VSL and it was all like a foreign language to me, but I did it. I kept, I kept learning. And then I created, I said, right, I'm going to create a a product. And I created this crappy little ebook called how to become a celebrity journalist. And it's little PDF and you can still find it on my site. And I put it up on a website and I, and I learned what an email autoresponder was and I learned what WordPress meant and I learned how to take people's payments and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and it was hard to be honest with you. Like, it, I mean, it was fun to learn, but it was a process. It wasn't, it wasn't easy. Um, and it took a little bit of work, but doing that. Um, and, and just to fast forward the story, I struggled for a couple of years, quite frankly. Like I, I really struggled doing it on my own. It was only when I actually hired someone, I invested in, in a, in a business coach mm. and paid him considerable money to mentor me that I actually sped up that, that process. So 
two different ways of doing it there. You, like, well, kind of similar, like you forced yourself to learn by offering your services for free. I just went in and tried to make it happen for my, for myself. And then ultimately paid someone to fast track my, my, yeah. my progress. Do you see what, it, do you see kind of like pros and cons to both scenarios? Yeah, absolutely. When you're getting started, um, you know, depending on your budget, your, your expertise, your skill level, your experience, all of that stuff, you know, if you're just at the early days of your career, you don't have a lot to bring to the table, you know? And so being able to volunteer and, uh, you know, create, create a lab for yourself where really low so you can fail in front of a small audience or fail when the stakes are low you can cut your teeth and start gaining some experience. Mm -hmm. And so saying yes to everything when you're early on in your career, I think is, is super important. And then it, there becomes a point in the kind of the life cycle of your career um, or even the business where it's actually more important to say no to things. And so finding that balance becomes uh, an art in itself, but saying no to projects, saying no to outside things, saying no to things that could be, lucrative and helpful for the business, but, um, saying no. So you, so you can, um, focus that much more on the things that really do matter. We'll come back to that. That's a very interesting point. Um, we'll come, we'll go through the life of the company a little bit, a little bit first, and then I'll come back and ask you about how to say no to things. But, um, okay, cool. So just as another example of that, by the way, uh, someone who worked for me for two years up until recently, um, he reached out to me couple of years ago and said, James, I want to do your Facebook ads for your 30 day no alcohol challenge program. Uh, you don't have to pay me anything. In fact, I'll even pay you the marketing budget for you. He was a long-term listener of the show and he just wanted to get his foot in the door. He wanted to get my attention. So he essentially came to me and said, I'll work for you for free for 30 days and I'll cover the, the advertising budget. I'm like, okay, no worries. I'll do that. And quite frankly, yeah. and quite frankly, he was actually really poor at doing the Facebook ads and it didn't work out. But I loved the fact that he tried. And then, so I asked him, you know, what else are you good at? What else can you do? And he said, well, I can do web development and stuff. I said, great, well, I'll, I'll get you to do that to start off with. He was with me for, for two years and really helped me with the, with the growth of that, of that business. So mm. if you're listening to this or watching, a great way to get your foot in the door is to just start, offer your services for free, um, give value, uh, and you can learn and, you know, ultimately that'll turn into uh, a, a paid, gig, paid gig later. So um, we're talking to uh, Evan Tardy. He is the, uh, the, is your title the president now? What's your, what's your title? President. President of DrAxe.com. He was employee number one. He's helped build DrAxe.com from zero to $100 million this year uh, in, in seven years. Okay, so the first year, let's break up these seven years. Um, the first year you said you tried a lot of stuff. So just walk us through things that you tried that did not work man going way back in in uh into the memory bank here yeah so year one i think we tried we we were going to model dave ramsey and dave ramsey had this um one of his kind of uh key pieces to his business is called financial peace university and so we were going to model the way that they kind of sold that into churches and then um uh, companies and had kind of a corporate program for people. And Dave's model is, you know, is, is a financial piece. So helping people with their budget and their finances and their money. Uh, and our message is, is around health. And so we had this idea that we were going to model Dave's selling approach where we were going to create a great program, uh, all, all encompassing. It was called the real body revolution. And we were going to sell that into churches. You know, I was going to get on the phone and just start selling and sell into companies and, and have this be the program that companies can take their employees through or churches can take their congregation through. We, we created the program. Um, we, we spent a lot of money on production and um, a full day event. It was a six hour program, really, really great stuff in there. Uh, got these DVDs printed. We got about a thousand of them printed and as soon as the, the DVDs arrived, <laughs> we got word from a potential, someone that we were looking to, to do some, to partner with and do some work together. They already had a church program and they were like, listen, you guys can't, you guys can't do your church program thing. 
And so before we ever got to try it, it was kind of shut down. And so we had, we had a thousand of these DVDs. There were a six set DVD thing, um, laying in the garage, literally collecting dust. And I started learning about webinars and just like you said, probably very similar, you know, <laughs> how to write a VSL, how to, you know, what is, what is an autoresponder? Um, started learning about some of these things and then specifically webinars. And so um, I'm looking at this product and I'm looking at these guys doing stuff online. I'm like, man, surely there's a fit here. If we could just, you know, tie all the pieces together, um, I think we, we could have something. And so at this time, you know, we were, we were just barely getting by um, in terms of company revenue. And so I put together a sales page. I put together a little go-to webinar account, um, set up a little Kajabi membership site, took all the content off of the Real Body Revolution, uploaded it, put it into an online membership site. For less than 500 bucks, we were <laughs> able to get this, this, this $30,000 production program that we created for 500 bucks, set up a sales page, set up an autoresponder, set up a little membership site. And I said, I, I, I called Josh and I'm like, hey, we, you know, we should put together a webinar and then send out an email. And I think if people get on the webinar, they'll go, you know, can go buy the program. And he's like, great. Um, how do we do a webinar? <laughs> and I'm like, Don't worry about it. Um, I'll just, you know, you just, you just teach, send you a link to download the, the thing. And at the end, tell people to go to this page. And so we did it, we set up the tech, you know, I was the tech guy and we didn't even know to be, be nervous because we didn't know what we didn't know. And we didn't know to be nervous that the tech would break down or that, you know, people wouldn't get the right link or any number of things that could happen. We sent out a link to our list, um, very small list at the time. And we had, we had a handful of people register and in one hour after, after the webinar ended, we made $10,000. And so that was a big turning point for us. Um, really figuring out, okay, it does not, we do not have to sell this one to one. We can sell it one to many. Mm. And so from then on for our online programs, you know, we've been trying to optimize that whole system and turn it into a flywheel and, and get better and better at doing that. Mm. Good on you. That's awesome. I, I remember in the first few months that I, after I'd hired my mentor, I was in Sydney, Australia, and I was, I was, it was this December of 2013. And in Australia at that time of year, it's beautiful weather. Like it's the middle of summer. Everyone's out on boats and yachts in Sydney Harbor. It's like Bondi beach is beautiful. It's amazing. And I remember sitting, I was staying at my, my brother's house. He was living there at the time. And I remember sitting in this, again, dark room, trying to learn Google AdWords, like trying to learn how to create a, a, Google, um, a Google ad and like just being so frustrated. And all my friends in Sydney were out and enjoying the sun and they're on Sydney Harbour and they're going to the beach and I'm, I'm inside in this like beautiful 85 degrees outside and I'm stuck in a dark room just, I can't figure this out. I can't figure this out. And, but ultimately you figure it out right? Like I had to yeah. go through that yeah. kind of pain. You kind of make that little breakthrough and, and fast forward to today, I'm still pretty crap at Google AdWords, but guess what? I've outsourced it to someone who is good at it and now he runs it for me. So for me, it was important to get to be like a two or a three out of 10 to yeah. learn how to do that stuff before I then brought in, brought in um, the experts. And I, I also, I, 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 when I coach my um, I have entrepreneurial students. I have a, a coaching program called the James Swanick inner circle. And I was just on a call with them earlier and I was saying like, try to get to like a three or a four out of 10 in any of these things, like starting a webinar, you know, writing emails for email auto responder, doing a Facebook live feed and then outsource it to, to, to someone else who's already at like a nine, nine out of 10. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's great. Great advice. I mean, that's honestly, I think if you want to grow your business, you've got to learn to, you've got to learn to master that what you're talking about right there, because you being the best Google AdWords advertiser for your company very soon is not what your company needs of you. If you're the founder and the CEO and, and the leader of the company. That's right. All right. So you'd say so this is the first year and the second year you kind of tried the webinar that work. What, what happened from there, Evan? What else did you try? What else happened? Yeah. So next we tried, um, 
we were retailing product. So we were buying um, high quality uh, product. It was a brand called Garden of Life, but we were buying it wholesale and selling it on our own store. And we had, I mean, our customers and fans were just the most amazing people ever. Because, uh, we could not afford to sell it at the same price that Amazon sold it. And since I was the shipping and fulfillment guy at the time, because we were a team of, you know, Josh and myself, um, the fulfillment was not near as fast as Amazon. And then obviously we don't have Prime and, you know, the delivery is not as fast, but our customers kept, you know, uh, honoring us with their, with their purchases. And so slowly we started developing a customer base, um, even though our products were more expensive and slower than Amazon. Uh, then after that, um, we started formulating our own products. And once we did that, the number one question we get is, this, this sounds great, this brand, this food sounds great, or this supplement sounds great, but what brand does Dr. Axe recommend? And so we would be referring to other brands uh, that Dr. Axe actually used and, and recommended. But once we created our own, uh, that was kind of a big tipping point for us. So... You mentioned there that your customers were willing to buy your, these other products like the garden uh, of life products um, from you, even though they could get it cheaper and quicker elsewhere. That implies that you had really a really great relationship with your customers. So what did you do? What did you proactively do to ensure that your customers loved you and that you created this wow factor with your customers? Yeah, so I don't know if I, I named the books earlier, but the two books that Dr. X, you know, when we first had our, I get my interview with him, um, that he asked if I had read, one was The 4-Hour Workweek and the other book was Crush It. And that was what he wanted to build the company around, kind of those two principles. And really around Crush It, giving so much value, showing up every day and just give, give, give to your customers. Uh, and so we that's what we modeled. And so we put out really high quality articles from day one. Uh, we invested in uh, researchers, editors, writers, graphic designers that would help us put together really well-researched, cited articles that we would send out. And that's how we grew and served and um, added value to our newsletter. And that's really where um, we, we were able to build that relationship. Okay. Nice work. So customer... Love. There's a company called Zappos, that's, which Tony Shea started, which later sold to Amazon for a billion dollars. And um, it started off as a shoe company. But if you ask Tony, um, he'll say that it actually wasn't a shoe company. It was a happiness uh, mm. company. Their motto, I think, for, for, for four or five years was delivering happiness. Yeah. And so literally, you know, even though they're selling shoes online, if you called their customer service phone number and you wanted to know what the local pizza place phone number was they would find out for you. Like even if it had nothing to do with being a customer of shoes, you could call them almost like a, a speaking Google and their customer service would go out of their way to help you. Um, yeah. Uh, I love that. In fact, we have all of our new team members um, specifically on our customer service team. That is the book they read as part of their onboarding is, is Tony Shea's delivering happiness. Yeah. And, uh, and I love the fact that they, they deliberately decided not to have a marketing budget and they used whatever that line item would be. And they, they uh, allocated that money to making customers delighted. You know, it's, it's an incredibly different and uh, pretty amazing yeah. philosophy. So let me ask you this in these first couple of years, when you're sort of losing money the first year, you're getting up to 50 K getting up to half a million in revenue, I guess at the end of year three, have I got my, my chronological order right around there? Mm -hmm. um, did you, did you doubt the company's um, prospects? Did you, what, what was like a low point? What kind of, were there times where you were like, Oh man, this is, a, this is a struggle. I don't know if I want to be doing this. Like maybe I should go and get a job somewhere and do like, or go and do my own business and just, you know, did those thoughts come into your head at all? They definitely did. Uh, you know, especially when my friends started graduating med school <laughs> and we're getting these job offers for 200, 250 K a year. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and I started wondering, you know, did I choose the right path here? 
um, one thing that always encouraged me personally, there were, there were two things. One was I, you know, I, I believed in Josh. I believed in his mission, his story and his message that at the end of the day, we were, we were doing something that made a difference in people's lives. So that was incredibly rewarding. But then on the financial side, when I, whenever I was discouraged or, you know, looking at my friends and I'm like, hey, man, <laughs> must be nice. Um, I, uh, I read a book um, by Keith Ferrazzi called Never Eat Alone that my brother gave me about <laughs> 10 years ago. And, and in it, he says, you learn in your 20s and you earn in your 30s. And so the whole time I just kept telling myself, you know what, no matter what the experience that I'm getting by going through this, the learning that I'm getting, um, it's worth it. And I've got, I've got the rest of my life to earn. So if I can just double down on my learning now. And so I would tell people I've got the best paid internship in Nashville. I still mm. do. It's so funny, isn't it? You always think that other people are doing way better than you in, in different areas of your life. And sometimes they are like in terms of, if you look at, you know, pure financial, someone's like you said, your friends are making 200 grand a year and you're not making that. Um, you can, you can take the short term view and say, well, oh, I'm getting killed here. Like I, maybe I should quit. Um, <clears throat> or you can take a long-term view, which is you're investing in your, in your training and your future, which will make you 200 grand a year plus for many years to come. Once you, once you, once you're good enough, uh, yeah. I still go through that. Like I'm, you know, I, I, I've got a, bi- a couple businesses now and million dollar businesses. And, and I'm still like find myself sometimes comparing myself to other people going, man, why am I stuck in this business for? I should be making 10 million or $50 million a year. Maybe I should go and chase that other thing. And that guy's making all that money. And I like, it's crazy. It doesn't matter. Like, like it's insane how the human mind yeah. works, isn't it? Evan? <laughs> it absolutely is. And, uh, and I don't get out of it either. I mean, I was talking to someone the other day that that head trash still bubbles up at times of who am I, who am I to, you know, be leading a company in the way I am. I don't have this experience that others may have. Um, but you know what? <laughs> We're all here. And if, if you show up, give it your best, you know, bring your smarts every day, bring your creative problem solving self to work. I think you're, I think you're going to be just fine. And, and the getting rid of the head trash, uh, it, it just, it just slows us down, you know, it just, yeah. Keeps us from doing, doing great stuff. Uh, just as a side story, Never Eat Alone by Keith Ferrazzi is my favorite book of all time and actually nice. um, completely changed my, my life when I read it in 2009. And here's a good, I won't go into the story because I've told it many times, but essentially Keith Ferrazzi is now actually someone we're, we both call the other very good friends, mm. which, is, which is a thrill for me because when I read the book, I was like, I was like in awe of this guy because yeah, he, he was, it was such a, had such an influence on my, on all of my relationships, platonic business, networking, entrepreneur, all, romantic, all of those kind of things. And then to find, to, to, to finally meet him and then become friendly with him and then ultimately be friends with him where he's text messaging me saying, Hey, do you want to meet up on, on Saturday on my phone? It's like a real, <laughs> it's a real thrill for me. It's kind of like the, yeah, yeah. Your, your hero is texting you to say, Hey, let's go hang out. It's like, oh, I love it. I love it. <laughs> Um, and if you're listening to this right now and you want to get my notes on that book, which is called Never Really Eat Alone by Keith Ferrazzi, go to my website, jameswanick.com, enter your email address. I will send you my personal notes on that book. So it's like the best three pages of notes that I took from that book. So you don't have to read the entire thing if you don't want to. Um, okay, cool. So let's move along. We're talking to Evan Tardy. Um, we're learning how to grow a business from nothing to $100 million in seven years. Evan is the, the businessman behind the company called DrAxe.com, uh, based out of Nashville, uh, Tennessee. So you pushed ahead, and now we're getting up to like year four, kind of like the jump from 500K, which is half a million to 2 million. What was the lever that really four times the business from year around that year three to, to, to year four? Because one thing that I've learned in business is that what got my Swanee's blue light blocking glasses business to a million dollars in revenue is not going to get me to $5 million in revenue. And then those skills are not going to get me to 20 million and so forth. So what were the, what was the lever point that got you from that uh, 500 K to 2 million in year around year four? 
I could not agree more. I mean, the same thing for us has been true from, <clears throat> excuse me, going from 500K to 2 million is not what took us from 2 million to 11 million and then 47. So going from 500 to 2 million, there were two things. One, that's about the time when we started really launching our own physical supplements. Um, so when we did about 500K, we had our, our first online program that we launched and that, that did well. Um, and then going from 500 to 2 million, we launched um, a handful of our own, you know, uh, formulated supplements that were branded Axe Naturals. And so, uh, like I said, everyone asked us, our customers asked us all the time, what, what, is the, what does Dr. Axe recommend? What's the exact brand? And so when we came out with our own, there was a lot of momentum just kind of built up behind that. The second thing was focus. Um, we had a lot of other things going on. <clears throat> um, myself, I had other stuff going on. Josh had a couple other businesses going on. And about that time, you know, he and I met up. There's a great little uh, raw organic restaurant here in Nashville that recently closed, but it's called Silly Goose. He and I, and, uh, and just kind of had, had like a four hour afternoon session to just kind of realign and reset the vision for the future. And, you know, we both kind of looked at each other and were like, hey, if, if this is going to grow, we, we're both 100% fully bought in and we're, we're going to make this thing happen. And so um, part of it was just that, that relentless focus on doing whatever it needs to do, whatever we need to do to get this to grow. And so <laughs> during that year, um, you know, we placed our first uh, inventory order of a thousand units for our first product that we launched. It was a, a green superfood. And we, you know, put together a sales page, sent out an email to our list and we're like, all right, we, we hope we can launch it with a bang and then have, you know, make some sales over the course of the month. And we sold out within 24 hours, which was great. We were high fiving. It was awesome. And then we looked at each other and we're like, uh, we have an eight week lead time here and we don't have product on the way. <laughs> Now you're and, speaking my language. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. And so, you know, we, we ordered product and then we ordered a second product behind that. And um, when one of them came in, you know, we kind of followed this, this feast or famine mode for about six months as we started getting some uh, historical sales trends and just kind of an ability to somewhat project a little bit, a little bit better and then get on top of some of the lead times and, and turn it into a flywheel where we weren't always sold out or, you know, fully in stock. And so that, that took about six months to kind of get that, get that rolling. Um, and then over the course of that year, as we really started focusing on growth, um, we also doubled down on, on SEO and then on um, really making sure we had a playbook for SEO for our social media uh, and then for our email marketing, those were, those were kind of the three pillars that we built on. And then not long after uh, was paid advertising as well. And so that, and then leading into the next year of growth for us, it was, it was finding amazing people to get them on the team. Um, and, and that's, you know, once we had uh, our products kind of dialed in and our, some of our sales processes dialed in, the next piece for us was, was hiring uh, A players. Yeah. So it, I, I know what you mean when you're talking about, um, you know, you sell out in 24 hours and then you're like, oh, hang on, this, there's an eight week lead time. When, when yeah. uh, my brother and I launched these glasses uh, and for, for the listener, I'm wearing my Swanee's blue light blocking glasses at the moment. We launched them on um, Black Friday in uh, November, 2015, so 18 months ago as we were recording this. And, uh, we sold, uh, I bought a minimum quantity of 300 units, right? That was what I negotiated with the, with the, with the manufacturer and, and, and 300 units. And we sold them steadily over 30 days. So we sold them out just before Christmas of, of that year. And we were like, great, we've sold 300 pairs. That's proven that people actually want the product. Awesome. And then we we're like, huh, hang on a second. Now we need to take that money and place an order for new product. And that's going to be an eight week turnaround. So we, so we lost all of that momentum that we'd built up 
um, reviews and sales velocity. Just to be clear, we, we started to sell these on Amazon and Amazon rewards you for obviously an increase in sales for the addition of, of reviews. Um, uh, you know, whether you get five star review or three star review. And so, and, and it promotes you on its page a lot, a lot more, the more reviews and the more sales you make. And so all of a sudden we're like getting this momentum, we're moving forward. It's like, great, that's awesome. And then boom, boom, we're out of stock. <laughs> so for January and February of last year, 2016, zero, mm. zero revenue. And it's funny because I look at a graph, I get these, um, daily sales reports now and, and on a month, I'll look at month to month as well. And you can see the business revenue. Like there's a little, little graph in like November and December. And then all of a sudden there's like nothing in January and February. And then it starts again in, yeah. in March and it goes up. So it, 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 it was frustrating at the time, but at the same time it was nest. You know, I feel like it was necessary. I didn't want to overextend myself and buy a thousand units and then no one buys them and I'm stuck with it, you know? So it's kind of like a necessary pro problem I found. Yeah, it is. It's part of that getting the flywheel going, you know, it's kind of going through validating, you know, for us, we had a, we had a small list at the time. So a thousand was a little bit more, uh, I guess, you know, appropriate for us, but you know, we didn't, we didn't come out of the gate with 10,000 and put everything on the line, do or die. Um, this is going to work or, or we're out of business kind of thing. It was, Let's do a thousand and then take that cash, reinvest it. And it, it's a little bit slower. It's a little bit more uh, bumpy to kind of get it going. But, you know, the benefit is that we're, we've never taken on investor money. Everything's been bootstrapped. And so we're able to continue to run the company and, you know, do things as we want to this day because we have not taken on a, a ton of investment or, or any sort of VC type of cash. Yeah. And when you said you've turned the inventory management into a flywheel, um, how, how did you manage to, to do that? And just to give context to the listener, this is a problem I'm going through with my business at the moment, or not a problem, but a challenge is um, you have to manage cash flow. Like that's the money that's coming in from the sales you make with then purchasing new product from China where there's an eight week, you know, time difference and when you order to when you get it. Um, and so you always have to be forecasting ahead of time. Like, are we running low on stock? How much stock are we going to need? Should we like spend a massive chunk of change and buy like 50 grand or hundred grand of product right now? Um, but then we don't have that cash in the business, but meanwhile, we've got to pay, staff to do the things that we've got to pay. There's all these other costs that are coming in. We, we too have SEO. We've got paid advertising. We have costs of, you know, just running the business. Amazon takes a cut from when they sell their business. I've got a web developer, which takes money. Like, so you've, you've got this constant battle, I guess you like between, uh, if you like between um, keeping cash in the bank because the, the, the life blood, the lifeblood of a business is cash flow. Like you have to have cash. And if you don't have it, then you're in a, you're in dire straits versus, um, Oh, I want to, I want to take that cash and I want to invest in inventory, but now I've got to wait eight, eight weeks to get it. And then however long it's going to take me to sell it before I get that, that, that money back. So that just creates a little bit of context. How did you get that to the machine, the flywheel that you have now where it all seems to be running pretty smoothly? Yeah, great question. There were a lot of bumps along the way. One book that was helpful for us is a book uh, by Greg Crabtree called Simple Numbers, Big Profits. Um, that's a very helpful resource. So for us, I often recommend if you can you know, do some sort of um, service, consulting, coaching, anything, especially if, if, you're, if you're a bootstrapped entrepreneur from you know, going from day one, and you're selling a physical product, your cost of goods, until you hit a certain tipping point, your, your cost of goods are going to co continually go back into funding the growth of the company. And so you're not going to be spitting off a lot of product as you're, you know, you're, you're experiencing and have gone through. So and, until you kind of start to hit a certain tipping point. If there's any way, you know, for the listener, if you can do coaching, consulting, anything to start getting a little bit of extra cash coming in that you can use to fund the inventory, um, that allows you to grow a little bit quicker as far as a cash flow perspective. Um, 
the other side of it is not taking money out, you know, um, and, and part of it is uh, Ryan holiday has a great book called the obstacle is the way. So part of it is going through rubbing two pennies together to make a dollar. That is what eventually will be one of the keys to your success when you come through, come out of it. So there are a couple of mindset things that I think are going on at that phase of the, the life cycle of the business. Um, a little more practically uh, on the tactic side, you know, if you're an Excel junkie, it's, it's at the end of the day, it's numbers and math. You know, you have your lead time, you have your burn rate and you have your, your cost of goods. <laughs> and so it's a matter of staying on top of those things. Um, one thing I would recommend is as soon as you possibly can um, look for an outsourced bookkeeper um, and they don't have to be full time but someone that can manage your books and, and really help process some of this stuff for you. Um, that's incredibly valuable. Um, so someone who's not, I, I wouldn't just hire an executive assistant. It would be a specific bookkeeper or there are great services out there that, um, that are outsourced CFO services, uh, where you can hire a CFO, mm-hmm. uh, a high level CFO for, you know, five hours a month or whatever. So the, the, between those things, I think, um, Greg Crabtree, simple numbers, some big profits, um, going, you know, just gearing up and muscling through making sure you do the math and then, and then hiring a bookkeeper. I think you're going to be, uh, heading in a good direction. Okay. So, so now we're, we, there was a jump from $2 million in around year four to $11.6 million. Was that from mostly from paid advertising, um, and finding the right people as you, you, you intimated there? Definitely hiring the right people. Uh, another thing we did at that time was creating a program that we validated with our audience <clears throat> rather than creating a program that we thought our audience would want. So years ago, we created a weight loss program. Um, we had a, a nifty title that we thought would work. It didn't work. It flopped. No one wanted it. <laughs> um, but we, we did no market val- validation. We just came out of the gate and said, here it is. Um, during that, during, uh, 2015, when we did 11.6 million, we validated first before we created a program. Then we launched an online program, um, based around some of the content that was doing performing really well on our site. Um, so there are a couple pieces like that. We continued to extend our product line, uh, during that year. And then we started advertising and, really started scaling things up. Yeah. It's, it's, um, in terms of creating products, too many entrepreneurs, me included decide what the customer is going to want and we go ahead and make it. And then we try to sell it to them, which is the wrong way to do it. Um, the best, the best and simplest way I have it stuck in my brain now in terms of always be asking the custo- potential customers first what they want is um, was trained to me by a, a, a business coach called Keith Cunningham. And I went to an event of his in Austin, Texas about three weeks ago called the four day MBA. Uh, and he's a man in his mid sixties. He's been around, you know, in business for years. He made hundreds of millions of dollars in the eighties in real estate, lost it all. And now he's, he's come back again and he's coaching people. And he uses this very simple um, sort of three sentence formula to ensure that you are always creating products that people are going to buy, right? Versus creating products that you want them to buy. And he says this, ask them what they want, go and get it, give it to them. (laughs) Pretty simple, right? But it's the difference between having a business that loses money, does okay and makes a hundred million dollars. So ask them what they want. So literally ask, people like ask your customers, ask your prospects, what is it that you want? Like what type of supplement do you want? What type of dating program do you want? What's your pain? Like what kind of program would you like me to make for you that will help you? Then you go and get it for them, which is you go and make the product or you go and create the program and then you give it to them. That's it. That's it. But yet we all like, Oh, I've got this idea. I reckon people are going to love it. It's going to be awesome. Like, no, ask them what they want and then go and get it. And then, Give it to them. So it seems like you've, you've kind of made a similar mistake early, but now you poll your customers or you, you do that research beforehand, Evan. Is that correct? 
That is. And there's a few specific things we do. One thing that <clears throat> has been really helpful for us, you can even go to uh, Amazon, you know, and look at Amazon reviews of products. And if you avoid the one star review and the five star review, it's you're typically the five stars are, um, you know, it's great. I love it. This is awesome. You know, it's just, it's not really helpful content. The one stars are usually just complaining about something irrelevant. The, the two and three star reviews are typically where people give pretty thoughtful feedback. So if you're, if you're looking to do a, a product, go find a, a similar product on Amazon, look at their reviews and pay attention to the two and three star. It, it may be some type of product and they say, I love it, but I really wish it would have had X, Y, or Z. Mm. And if you can go create that product with X, Y, or Z, you're, you have already have a market there that's, that's looking for something like that. So that's an option uh, for us. What we do, we, you know, I mentioned we carry, we wholesale, uh, wholesale and retailed uh, Garden of Life products early on. And so for us, we, we could order in small quantities and not have to go through the whole formulation process and the minimum order quantity uh, of a thousand for our own product. We could order, you know, 50 and put it up on our store and just see if anyone is looking for, if anyone is actually buying, in our case, it might be like a garden of life vitamin C and compare that to a green superfood. And for us, the green superfood was selling 10 times more than any of our other products. So when we went to go create our own green superfood or our, our own supplement, the product we started with was a green superfood. Mm -hmm. uh, vitamin C didn't sell. And so we never formulated our own vitamin C. We just stopped selling it. So there, you know, you can do that by using real customer data and, and kind of taking a lean approach. Um, another great resource on that is um, the lean startup by Eric Reese. Mm. So just on that, I, so for example, we have a, this is my company here, Swanic Sleep, and this is a sleep supplement that we uh, have just launched and we're testing various things. So I actually ordered a thousand units of this um, to start off with, just assuming that it, that, um, that it would go great and that we'll find a way to sell it. So what's a different way that I could have done that, which wouldn't have overcommitted me to buying a thousand different pills like how could i have tested whether there was a demand how could i have in a more cost efficient cash flow management way have tested whether there was indeed a market for people buying a sleep supplement on my swanic sleep site two ideas come to mind immediately one is just talking to people so if you have any sort of list any sort of facebook you know any way to get people on the phone you know one thing I really like that they harp on in uh, the lean startup and then Steve blank is famous for this in the four steps to the epiphany is he taught, he, he pushes engineers to get out of the building. The last thing you want to do is spend a year in your garage as a developer coding up some fabulous software that you think the world needs only to launch it and no one cares. <laughs> You've wasted a year. And so actually getting outside of the building and talking to real potential customers and putting it in their product. Hey, uh, do you have problems sleeping? Uh, if so, tell me about it. You know, mm. And then starting to dig in and find out actually what they're actually looking for. So that's one option. Another is to set up a simple ClickFunnels landing page and uh, take a picture of a sleep product, put it up there, or even your uh, the mock-up of your product put up on a landing page accept the order and uh, you can even sell a different product you know product a, a similar product that's a sleep product from amazon and put it up on a landing page accept the order um, run ads to it see what the cost per acquisition is and then buy the product from amazon ship it directly to the customer and that's a very lean way to you know, kind of t get some, get some back of the napkin kind of math that you can start running some if then scenarios. Mm. I'm going to, I'm it's, I love that idea. I've never done that idea before where you accept the order and then you, you either say, Oh, sorry, we're sold out. Um, but you, you, you basically get the intention of, of theirs to buy, or you sell a, a similar product that yours, you, you propose yours to be, and then you ship it from Amazon. So I haven't done that. I'm actually just about to start testing that. 
in my 30 day no alcohol challenge funnel because I want to, uh, I want to create a detox pill. Like people who take my 30 day no alcohol challenge program, they take a supplement that helps them detox throughout the 30 days and helps them avoid alcohol, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't want to go and spend five grand buying a product that I think people will buy. I want to test it first mm. to, to see whether they will buy. It. And then I go and spend the five grand buying my product. So, yeah. I'm glad that you mentioned that. I'm going to, I'm going to go and I'm in the process of building pages to, to do that for the first time. Yeah. Um, Third option on that yeah. real quick is, is to just simply pre-sell, you know, and say, Hey, we are um, the, the first 100 customers. You're going to get a, a 30% discount. Um, and then you're up front that, and you say, Hey, listen, we're looking at, at formulating a product that it's going to have all these benefits. You write the sales page uh, put it up and then and let people know that they're getting some sort of benefit by being a beta or, or a, a pre-sale customer. You take that cash from the pre-sales and use that to fund your first inventory purchase. Yeah. I mean, oh God, I've heard that before and I can't believe I didn't think about that again. Like it's amazing with all the knowledge that you put in your brain, you still, you need to be told like two, three, four times before you do it. That's actually genius. So I, I could just go into my existing customers and say, hey, I'm gonna. This is the, this is the supplement I'm gonna create. It's gonna retail for. It's gonna be forty nine ninety nine. I'll give it to you for twenty to twenty five dollars now. It'll be eight weeks away, etc. And then yeah, so now you get that money, and then you use that money to buy the product. And then and if not enough people buy, you say, you know what? Sorry, we're not we're not actually gonna go ahead with it, and you refund them the money. Yeah, exactly. Damn, genius. <laughs> can't believe I didn't do this beforehand. Ah, I'm angry at myself now. <laughs> this is good stuff. All right. We're talking to Evan Tardy, how to grow a business from nothing to a hundred million in seven years. Um, I could, I mean, I could literally talk to you for hours on this stuff. I love it. I love it, Evan, but I want to be conscious of your time. So let's, um, let's go from paid advertising, um, finding amazing people. What was the lever from 11.6 to 40, 47? So it was SEO, email marketing, uh, social media marketing in, in paid and really <clears throat> was that from 11.6 to 47 or was that 2 million to 11.6, 11.6 to 47. And, and my point is it, it was two to 11 and 11 to 47. And my, my <laughs> That's your dog there. There we go. Oh, the beautiful my dog. soothing I sounds of Evan's there dog. You go. <laughs> Sorry about that. That's all right. Carry on. <laughs> We've got a I'm little bit this. of light comic relief in the middle of the yeah. podcast. There we go. I'm doing this from, from my home office here. Um, so, and, and my point with that is that really at a certain point, you know, we used to, we used to look at people that were so much, so f much further beyond us and doing so much more revenue that we're like, man, there's got to be something in the black box. You know, if we could just reach in and, and figure out what that, the insider secret is, um, that's what's going to get us to the next level. And really at a certain point, it really is you have your processes down, you have your product down, you have your sales system down at a certain point, it's more of the same. And so scaling up looks like hiring amazing people to go execute on the processes and, and make the processes better and execute on the advertising and make it better. And exactly what you were saying is not, not being the, you know, letting yourself be the lid of the organization as a, you know, a three out of 10 at, Aver at uh, Google ads. Mm. You don't want your company to be a three out of 10. You want your company to be a 10 out of 10. Mm. So you need to go hire a 10 out of 10 advertiser and turn them loose. So for us, it was more the same, but really, you know, every problem is a who problem. And so Keith Frazzi, I'm sure, it must have coined that at some point. I don't know where that quote came from, but for us, it, it kind of stuck during that period that uh, we have world-class products, programs, and now it's all about getting the right people on the bus. And is that the same strategy for 47 million to 100 million, or if, which is your projected revenue this year? Is it just more of that, more of the right people, getting the right people on the bus, getting the wrong people off the bus, and then systems and processes? It really is. It really is. It's that simple. And so for us, you know, it, it looks like at, at this scale, 
uh, going from 47 to 100 million, we're able to do more things now because of the resources, right? So we're mm. able to, now we're no longer just online because of the resources and the partnerships and everything like that, we're able to get into retail stores. And so, but at the end of the day, it's a process, it's people, um, and it's people making the process better and executing on the process. And so it really is in a lot of ways, very simple and more of the same, but from, you know, going from the kitchen table to where we are now, I followed a very similar path to you in that I learned just enough to be dangerous. And then as quickly as I could figure it out and as quickly as I could hire and find someone to take over with it, that's what we did. And, quickly got it off of my plate and had someone else who was way better at it take the ball and run with it. Mm. There's a great book called Rocket Fuel. Uh, and the author talks about there's two types of people in the business. There's the visionary and there's the integ integrators. Um, it sounds like Dr. Axe is the visionary and you are the integrator. Is that a fair assessment? I think so. Um, I'm not familiar with the integrator, but it, it sounds about right <laughs> as far as what I am. There's, are you familiar with the book um, called The Synergist? No. By Les McAllen? Mm -mm. Um, that one's an incredible book. Once you start leading a team of, you know, five, 10 people, you really start to see some of these, these dynamics. So he has the visionary, he has the operator, which may be the uh, integrator. Yeah, that's of, what it is, the operator, yeah. And then the third part of that is the processor. And so they're kind of three natural operating styles that everyone has. Some of them are more, more predominant than others. Um, but everyone has a primary and a secondary for the most part of how they just kind of naturally operate. So I would say Josh, you know, in our case is the visionary. Um, and then his secondary is probably like an operator. My primary is, um, is split between, you know, I'm, I'm half visionary, half operator. My visionary is not as big as Josh's. And so his is, that's his, he's like visionary with a capital V. Mm. And then your processor is someone that, you know, if we're looking at an analogy of we're going to, we're going to, we're all on a hike together and we come to a, uh, we come to a, a ravine or a dip where we have to cross a river and, and get to the other side. The visionary has already jumped, <laughs> you know, they're the, the ready, fire, aim kind of guys. The operators like, all right, how can I, if I run really fast and I, and I like do my stretches and then I jump at just the right angle, I'm going to, I'm going to jump across this river. And the processor is like, hold on guys, if we slow down and build a bridge, <laughs> We can just walk right across. And so each of those roles are, are really important. And the synergist is someone who's able to step outside of their natural operating style and assess the situation and say, what does the situation need? Does, do we need to build a bridge to cross this little trickle of water or should we just step over it, <laughs> you know, you know and, and not over process things? Or if, if this is the Mississippi, hey, it's probably good that, you know, we stop and build a bridge and not try to swim, swim across it every time. I probably need a couple of those in my company. I'm more like, let's go. We're going it now. We're going over it. Let's charge over the hill a million miles an hour. And that's got us to here. Like I, I, like I think my, one of my great strengths, if I had to blow smoke up my own ass, so to speak, would be I'm great at starting things and just getting that momentum going and then bang. But I'm noticing now like what's got me here is not going to get me there. So I need to put people in place who can – create systems and processes and, and, you know, have some kind of structure around how we actually execute on certain things. Um, having said that, um, you know, uh, if you don't, if you're not embarrassed by your first product, you, you didn't launch quickly enough, you know, like yeah. you, there's a, I, I hate this overthinking and dissecting and like, Oh, maybe we should do this. Should, should we? I'm like, let's just go. Let's test a lot. Let's test quickly. Let's fail quickly if we have to. And then we use that Intel, to, to go from there. But I, it's, you're right. I think, I think every business, every company needs someone who not so much puts on the, puts on the reins a little bit to hold you back, but maybe just puts in some systems and processes around how you're going to go charging over the, over the hill, a hundred miles an hour. Yep. Uh, the guy that we brought on that is a processor that was really a, a great counterpart to myself. Uh, his famous saying is let's go slow now so we can go fast later. Hmm. I like that. I'm going to write that down. Let's go slow now. Let's go slow now so we can go fast late, later. I like that. And how uh, that plays itself out for us, just a, a real practical is, 
we would hop on to some scrappy tool. We'd hop into Infusionsoft and have a big idea and create a campaign real quick and then let's get it out the door. We want to see the, we want to get customers to look at it. We want to see the data and we would do that and we'd leave kind of this, this web of, you know, just kind of a mess behind us. And it, but it was a lot faster. It was fun. You know? Yeah. And, uh, and what Mike would do would, would come in and say, okay, what do, we, we won't ship on it today, but we can get it out by early next week, but it's going to be organized and we're going to be able to look back on the data in a predictable way. And then if it works, we can build on it rather than recreate, recreate the will every time. So, um, Again, there's, it's, there's it's a place for both, for both strategies. Exactly. <laughs> it's assessing what the situation needs and being able to apply it. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. Well, that's how we got there. You're going to do a hundred million dollars this year uh, in revenue and projected uh, revenue. And that's was a pretty amazing, uh, amazing blueprint there, Evan. So we've got, you know, starting off just trying to break even, maybe you're losing a little bit. You're trying new things. You're adjusting. It's not the strongest of the species that survive, it's the, the it's those that are most adaptable to change. So they had all this money in DVDs, they changed it, they changed the format, all of a sudden now they're making more money. You're creating your own products, you've got some increased focus. Um, you're now asking the customers what they want a little bit more rather than just assuming what they want. You're finding amazing people, A players to join the team. You're adding some things like SEO and some concentrating on your social media, email marketing, paid advertising. And then it really comes into dialing in systems and processes, getting the right people who can create the right systems and processes. So then you can scale and make that big jump from 11 to 47 and 47 to 100. And it enables you with, with more cash flow, enables you to do more things and to test more big things that can ultimately lead to even more uh, more revenue. Now that is a, that's an amazing blueprint and congratulations on your success. Um, what's the lowest point that you've had? Like I know that somewhere along the way there was a big mess up or something disastrous happened and, or you personally just felt, Oh man, this is like some, this is too much. Like what was the lowest point for you in, in the business despite this seemingly amazing financial success you've had? We've had a lot, you know, I, I think the one thing I would encourage anyone who's listening is that um, I, I was listening to the Mixergy podcast all the time and um, all the tips and tricks and Andrew Warner's, he's just, he's awesome. Uh, but I remember the exact intersection that I was sitting at listening to the Mixergy podcast in my car and he was talking to someone who was kind of on the other side of their business was profitable and all that. And he was asking them, what was it like when, before you were here, you know, when you were struggling and he just kind of, he just shared the, the real stuff, you know? <laughs> and I remember thinking there's, I'm, I'm going to get there, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to get there. And I still, to this day, you know, I feel like I'll, I'll retire when I'm 85, you know, I feel like I'm just getting started, you know, and I've got so much, you know, learning to do myself that, um, the, I think the encouragement is we drop the ball all the time, you know? And I think the, the biggest, um, or the lowest point I think for myself is when, um, you know, we made the wrong hires and we had to kind of face that and let them go. Um, those, anything that involves people because you're, you're impacting their livelihood and their families um, is incredibly hard. So going through some of those periods is really hard. Um, you know, taking, uh, taking risks and being wrong um, is, it's always hard. So there, there are a number of those. Um, I'm trying to think, I'm trying to think any other specifics. The biggest one that that keeps coming to mind is it has to do with people. Um, those are the ones that, that hurt the most. Yeah, I, I know what you mean. I, I had to finally fire someone in my organization after uh, more than a couple of years with me uh, this year, earlier this year. And it was hard because that person was with me from, you know, day one from one of the, one of the businesses and uh, you, you become emotionally attached and you romanticize the story about, you know, how it was, you know, we started it from here or we, 
you know, like you came on in the development phase and everything, but it just got to a point where it was obvious that, that it was no longer working and having that conversation was super awkward and challenging yeah. and, 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 and difficult and hard. Um, but you have to do it. There's times where you just actually got to make these decisions in the business or the business suffers. And if the business suffers, it can die. Exactly. Exactly. So there, there are a few things that kind of helped me through that specifically. Um, one, you know, there's, a, I went through this book called scaling up by Vern Harnish and, um, in that the, he kind of draws out this grid of productivity and then like culture fit, you know, so you have a matrix, um, or, or an X, Y axis on, on one side is, you know, uh, high productivity, uh, low culture fit or high productivity, low productivity, high culture fit, low culture fit. And so, you know, we literally like plotted everyone on that in, on that grid and everyone who was in the high productivity, high culture fit. I mean, those are essentially your A players, everyone that was in the high productivity, low culture fit, you want to, you know, they're good. Let me make sure I get this right. <laughs> mm-hmm. Everyone that everyone that's high productivity, low culture fit, you want to, um, move them towards high culture fit. Everyone that's low productivity, low culture fit. I mean, those are obvious fires. Mm. Low productivity, high culture fit. Uh, those are the ones that um, you, you really got to work on some of their, their um, tactical skills. Mm. Mm. So that, that leads me to one other thing. And this mm. is the secret sauce. The secret sauce of the, the whole thing? The secret sauce. The or whole just thing. of people, which is the, the whole, whole thing. The, uh, there it is. Okay, it's that's, people, all, we, that's, all, we that's all we got time for, Evan. Thanks so much for joining us on the show. And fair, See well, you on I the can... next one. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's have it. The secret sauce. Here it comes. The secret sauce. All right, listen to this. So if the secret sauce has to do with people, okay? So imagine you have, even, even yourself, and if you just reflect on yourself and think, Days when I feel like, man, I am bringing it. I'm, you know, cutting through problems. I don't have the head trash. I'm just like, I am bringing it. And this is my A game. I call it, you know, bringing your creative problem solving self, right? And you, you have some of these days in, in a week or over the course of a month where you're like, wow, I, I was not just like, a, you know, one and a half times better than I normally am. Or when I'm, you know, just kind of like going through the motions, I wasn't like two times better. I'm like five times better on those days where I'm, you know, I jump out of bed. I'm like ready to go. I bring my energy and real tangible things come from that. I was interviewing a guy a few weeks ago and pretty quickly, you know, within five minutes, you can tell, um, you know, if, if they're the right fit or not. Um, and so right away I was like, this guy is, this is, this is not the right guy. I don't even know how he got in here, but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to wind this interview down, but he brought up a name that if I was just going through the motions, he mentioned a, a friend of his and, um, said she was great at, you know, affiliate management and, uh, we're looking for an affiliate manager right now. And so if I wasn't, if I was just kind of going through the motions, I'd be like, yeah, yeah, cool, whatever. Uh, nice to meet you, you know, walking out. Um, but I was in this, like, you know, bringing my creative problem solving self to work day. And I'm like, listen, I'm sorry to tell you, but you're, you're not the right fit for this role, but we are looking for an affiliate manager. Would you be up for making an introduction to this, this girl you mentioned? He's like, absolutely. I'd, I'd love to. And so in that interview, <laughs> I got a referral to someone who I'm interviewing next week that could be a really great candidate for us. Uh, and so that is, you, you start getting these all new types of opportunities open up when you're bringing that level of, of effort to work. So that's a long story, but if you can create a culture where your team brings their creative problem solving self to work every day, it's not just one or two times more productivity and effort and results that you're going to get from your team. I think it's close to five times the results. So you're really getting like a five X multiple on your team and your talent. And it's not just, salary you know it's not just paying people more i think salary is is just part of the equation you know there's four things that that really drive people specifically in kind of a work environment you have personal growth mm-hmm. you have 
having, having friends at work, people that they like working with, Mm -hmm. you know, their salary is part of it. And then people being a part of a company and a mission that's bigger than themselves. And so creating a culture where you, you tie in all of these things, the people that to do the work, you can train for a lot of the skills, you know, the skills can be, can be learned. Um, some skills are a little bit harder than others. Sure. But this culture in this, um, this community, you know, this way where you you've created in your company, people who bring their creative problem solving self to work every day. That's the secret sauce. Because even if your strategy is wrong and some days it is, um, you, if you have a great team, you're going to win every time. Mm. Well said. Final question. I did allude to, to this earlier and that was how to say no. So you were Mm -hmm. saying that at some point along the road that you had to learn the skill of saying no to opportunities that opportunities that maybe you know will make money. Um, a lot of people have this idea or or, or preach this idea that just say yes to everything. Yes, Mm -hmm. yes, 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 yes. At what point did you start saying no? Why did you start saying no? And what have been the results of saying no? So what point did we start saying no? And yeah. Then, and and why? why? Like, yeah. So why, when and why did you start saying no? What, what were some of the things that you were saying no to? Why did you start saying no? And what has been the results of you saying no? So for us, um, some of the things that we say no to are the kind of the instant gratification things like, let's just get it out the door and, and just really quick, let's do this launch sooner because we're, we have the product ready. Let's just launch it. You know, so old operating styles that we used to have, like it's here, it's ready. Let's start selling it versus let's set up a really well done funnel that we know is right from the beginning. And it takes a few weeks longer, but we know it works uh, and we can test and validate and build and optimize the funnel rather than uh, just kind of put something out there because we're, we're anxious. To six. So there's no from like project, you know, standpoint and launch standpoint. Um, for us, there's no in um, business opportunities. So partnerships that we've said no to, uh, product lines that we've said no to, that we've killed. Um, we have we have three brands that we were looking. We we had a retail strategy that has shifted, and so we're winding down three supplement brands right now and consolidating. So. You know, for us, it, it, I, th- I think the framework may be more helpful than the actual no things that we've said no to. Um, so we, we have a handful of different things. One is the, the, the filter of every time a new product or project comes through, one of the filters is if we say yes to this, what are we going to say no to? And really starting to view time as not just an unlimited resource you really do, you have a limited amount of time to be able to spend on something. And so part of it is, is um, scoring and, and measuring your time a little bit better. Um, another one, is, another framework that we use is, uh, is an ICE kind of uh, scoring uh, acronym. And so it's impact, uh, confidence, and then um, what is the E? <laughs> Uh, this is the, the, the manager of a hundred million dollar a year company folks who's forgotten his own lessons. <laughs> yeah. I don't have them all memorized. Um, yeah, I delegated that. There you go. Clever. <laughs> but yeah, so, so ice, so impact, confidence and ease. So it's a simple framework if you can remember it. Um, but you know, impact to the organization, uh, what's our confidence that it's actually going to do that. And then, you know, the ease of which we can do that. And so, you know, there's, there's a handful of frameworks. Project managers are um, equipped with a lot of frameworks. But um, I, I think the easy one for us just from a, like a rule of thumb is if we say yes to this, what are we going to say no to? Mm-hmm. Well, there you go. Evan Tardy who was employee number one at dracks.com. Make sure you go and check out... Uh, Evan's business there at drax.com. 
com. That was the blueprint from zero to a hundred million dollars in seven years. Congratulations on your success doing that, Evan, and well done. Good on you for pushing through the dark days as they all always come. Um, series Thank of ups you. and downs. I always think it's kind of like a, like a heartbeat. It's like high highs and then, you know, temporary low lows. And then it's like high highs again. And as long as you're moving in that direction of always going up, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. I appreciate that. And where can we uh, find a little bit more about you besides drax.com anywhere else where you're on social media or somewhere where our listener might want to reach out to you? Sure. Yeah. I'm on Facebook. So Facebook, uh, Evan Tardy and just message me, add me as a friend. Would love to connect. Um, we're always hiring awesome people. There you go. So yeah, if you're looking for, <laughs> looking for a gig and want to work with amazing, uh, company, you want to work with Evan, reach out to Evan on his Facebook page. So Evan, thank you so much, Matt. I really, I appreciate your time. This has been awesome. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. And to you, the listener and to the viewer, thank you so much. And I will catch you on the next one.